We're here in Hong Kong with Joe Lubin, the co-founder of Ethereum and the CEO of Consensus. Joe, great to have you in Hong Kong to speak with us. Hey, Henry. How are you? Well, Joe, I mean, last time we were together, we were doing an interview was at Davos in January. Yeah. Since then, I mean, there's been a lot of developments in the broader crypto and blockchain ecosystem. What is the one or maybe two developments that you think were the game changers for the past the past year? Glad you said two because it's really more like five or ten. <laughs> um, but it, I could try to limit it to two. Yep. Um, the first and most important is scalability. Uh, so yep. a year ago, we're just starting to see scalability come to the, the Ethereum ecosystem. And yep. now through a bunch of different technologies, we have hundreds and thousands of transactions per second yep. um, being actually utilized uh, yep. in state channel technology uh, or in um, side chain networks or optimistic roll-ups or essentially games and exchanges bringing, yep. bringing their own transactions per second uh, to the Ethereum ecosystem. And that's going to be magnified enormously uh, with Ethereum 2.0 next yeah, year. So scalability with then hopefully so, 2.0. Yeah, and so, so the number two element um, is what people have been talking about for many, many weeks. Um, it's price stable currencies or, or stable coins. Yep. It's the Libra project. Yep. Um, it's that project uh, whose greatest asset is their greatest liability. So I'm a big fan of Libra, but yep. I, I don't believe that uh, Calibra uh, should be allowed to exist. I think Facebook already knows way too much about us adding our financial transactions and our financial history to all of that is just, it doesn't seem like a good thing to do for the company that has effectively lost a lot of trust uh, of people because it's been exploitative of people and governments because it is effectively a weapon of mass social manipulation. So Interesting. price stable coins, great stuff uh, as our monetary systems globally yep. are moving towards end of life potentially uh, as yield curves flatten and invert and we move towards possibly the last great recession. Yep. Um, we're going to need an, a new monetary regime and these price stable tokens sitting on baskets of currencies or commodities or different kinds of assets. Um, they're going to enable people and company and countries to uh, essentially have a price stable uh, currency and buy fairly effortlessly uh, from across borders. But we don't want Mark, for instance, to control monetary policy for a whole bunch of nations. So we need a lot of these things. We need a lot of choice. They, we need different characteristics and the ability to, to move back and forth. So a fan of Libra, not a fan of Calibra. But actually, you talk about you know, central banks, you know, central bank digital currencies. What's your view on that? Today, you know, we had the, the PBOC talk about it. What's your view on the central bank digital currencies? Um, so I feel like um, digital currencies that central banks release um, are going to use cryptographic primitives the way blockchains do, but I don't know that they need to be realized on blockchains. Yep. Um, if a central bank um, wants to have a whole bunch of different actors independently responsible for different nodes, then certainly a blockchain infrastructure is the appropriate architecture for that. Yep. But I don't think that's necessary for a central bank to yep. do that. Um, that would be a a radical philosophical departure, I think, and, and it would be very welcomed by many around yep. the world. But uh, you know, there, there are calls uh, recently that I read about in the United States for um, an American uh, price stable token to be um, to not be issued by the Fed, but to to be commercial, uh, commercially issued to maybe have uh, competition. Crazy idea in in free market capitalist societies. Um, currently, the price of money is determined by uh, a centralized authority, a, a small yep. group of people. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we had a, a bunch of competing currencies? And in that situation, you absolutely need blockchain because yep. uh, you, you need the trust and, and the um, inability to improperly manipulate that sort of system. And on that point, uh, Joe, what about, what's your view on the future of decentralized finance, DeFi? There's obviously a lot of talk about it. Do you think we're going to see, a part of some of the applications we have right now, do you think we'll see it go more mainstream over the coming years? Yeah, so DeFi, open decentralized finance yep. is very exciting. So regulated, de decentralized, quasi-decentralized finance, that's, that's great stuff. Yep. Um, 
but uh, the fascinating stuff is this permissionless Absolutely. ecosystem that's developing largely yeah. on Ethereum. Um, we have lending borrowing systems, we have money market systems, we have payment systems, we have price stable token systems, yeah. um, we have subscriptions and licensing and synthetic assets and prediction markets and derivatives. Yep. Um, so we, we have tokens that are containers for entire portfolios of tokens and you can program them to rebalance themselves and you can guarantee rebalancing. And so all of these financial instruments are permissionlessly accessible on Ethereum and they're all sitting inside essentially the same computer, the same world yep. computer. So they're all in this, they're all composable uh, and synergistic inside this single execution space. So you can uh, essentially like financial Lego blocks, you can just mix and match them permissionlessly. It's, uh, very it's, exciting. it's not a very mature space right now, yep. but the amount of money that's being staked and put into these systems is getting quite large. Um, and uh, it's just fi fascinating, Absolutely. rapidly evolving financial innovation. And actually, you're mentioning Ethereum. Like, what's your view on the future of Ethereum, the next 12 to 24 months? What so, do you expect the big developments to take place? Right. So, uh, Ethereum 1.0 yep. is plenty scalable for things like DeFi. Right. Right? And so, lots of things are getting built on Ethereum 1.0. Yep. Ethereum 1.0 is only 25 transactions per second. Yep. So, layer two of Ethereum 1.0, yep. we're already seeing hundreds and thousands of transactions per second with, with different technologies. Yep. Um, in Q1 of 2020, uh, Ethereum 2.0 starts to go live. It'll be released in seven phases, but really the, the first three yep. phases are the major phases. Uh, it's very likely that by the end of 2020, we'll have the second and third major phase released. Might not be a super sophisticated version of that, but uh, first phase is the beacon chain, the heartbeat of the system, proof of stake. The second phase is 64 shards of data, so lots more data. The third phase is uh, computation, execution yep. environment, so that you can have a full operating blockchain system. That's going to be exciting. And uh, Ethereum 1.0 gets migrated over to Ethereum 2. That's going to be exciting. I think a lot of people are looking forward to that. It's going to be quite exciting. But also, maybe to finish it off, what's your view on enterprise blockchain, Joe? I mean, obviously, two, three years ago, we had a lot of work being done on blockchain, innovation labs, and so on and so forth. Do you think now we're seeing more uh, blockchain move into you know, the, the management of the bank, the real concrete applications within financial institutions? Sure. Yeah, so an enterprise blockchain, from our perspective, is just exploding. Um, yeah. um, so much interest, uh, so many systems are getting built. It's no longer little proofs of concepts. It's, uh, yeah. it's real systems that we're yeah. deploying. Uh, we built ComGo, a commodity trade finance platform, yeah. 15 major banks and energy yeah. companies. Um, around half a billion dollars was yeah. traded this summer um, through a bunch of different transactions. Yeah. Uh, we've built a, an exchange that's on public Ethereum that's regulated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So um, we're all about um, maximally decentralized blockchain platforms. That's Ethereum, that's a base trust layer, that's a financial plumbing layer, potentially a base settlement layer for digital assets globally. Um, but companies and corporations don't always need maximal decentralization. Yeah. Uh, they need minimum viable decentralization. They need enough uh, decentralization, enough nodes so that they all feel like they're operating on a trustworthy platform that none of their counterparties can improperly manipulate. So we're going to see millions of those networks developed over the next decade we'll or two. We look forward to that. It's very exciting times ahead. Joe, always a pleasure to have you on board. Thanks, Thank man. you.